Join me in the dark splendors of ancient Egypt. Stand with me amid Moses and the Egyptian plagues, and before him stretched the wonders of the Nile. Think of a temple with 50 to 70 foot high red granite and limestone pillars that were as many as a forest. There were 40 miles of walls of the ancient temple of Karnak at Luxor. 40 miles of carved and painted with cartouches. That's that round thing that has the little hieroglyphics. That was their signature called a cartouche. It was very impressive. But then to stand before the living God, Pharaoh himself, was very threatening. And to be 80 years old, as Moses was, and to stand before the most powerful king of the ancient world must have been overwhelming. But that's where we meet Moses as we go through Exodus. The theme of Exodus is the way out. First of all, it's the way out of bondage for the Israelites in chapters 1 through 12. It shows them the way out of bondage and into true freedom. And the purpose of those first 12 chapters, succinctly stated, is to show that God is powerful. And he is. And I'll I'll explain that. We're going to come back and spend the majority of our time in those first 12 chapters. Secondly, the book has a second division, the way out of ignorance. Now, these people that got delivered out of Egypt didn't know much about God. They only knew one thing. He got them out of there. They didn't know anything about how to make him happy, how to obey him and please him, and how to worship him. And so the second section of this book is the way out of ignorance. It's into God's law, into his program, his program of how to approach him and his program of of how to please him and, and what sacrifices were acceptable. It shows that God is holy. God likes things done a certain way. I don't know if you ever thought about that. There are only two chapters in the Bible that talk about creation. There are 15 that talk about what board to put where in the tabernacle. Isn't that a little disproportionate? you ever think about that? I mean, God really wants worship done his way. Uh, First of all, God protected them in chapters 13 through 15. That's the Red Sea. And and by the way, that's the Red Sea. It's not the uh, uh, Reed Sea, as some of them call it. And it wasn't a mud puddle. And that's if you ever go to a rummage sale or a book sale or a library sale and you're looking at commentaries, if it's an Old Testament commentary, you want to see if it's a good one, Look at how they, create, how they treat creation, the exodus, and Jonah. If they think Jonah, you know, that's a, a myth. If they think that the exodus was a couple hundred people and they went through the puddle, and et cetera, et cetera, and creation is kind of who knows what happened, then you know it's a non-conservative commentary, and therefore it's probably not worth buying unless you're doing a technical study. In the New Testament, look at the miracles of Christ and look at the, uh, the miracles of the apostles and see what they say about that. I have one commentary. It says Paul's conversion was this. It says that Paul was riding on a horse as he came over the rise on Damascus. The sun was so glinting off the alabaster roofs that it just made him blind. He fell off, hit his head, and, you know, he was never the same. That is a liberal commentary. I had another one that talked about the feeding of the 5,000, and it said that Jesus came to the people, and while he was talking to them, he was an illusionist, and he got them all thinking about what he was doing, and he backed up and put his hands behind him, And the disciples were hiding in a cave, and they handed him bread. And he started passing it out as fast as they could. The the walking on the water, uh, and we're talking about liberals that don't accept the biblical record. The walking on the water, according to the liberals, is that Jesus was on a sandbar. And the reason the disciples were getting nowhere in the storm, they were stuck on the sandbar, and they were paddling their arms off, and the waves were hitting them and bouncing the boat on the sandbar. And Jesus walked up on the sandbar and got in and says, Come on, guys, run the sandbar. It's okay. That's called liberalism. God says, I'm very concerned that you realize I protected them. God protected them. He took them through the Red Sea. God provided for them. That's 16 through 18. He gave them manna in chapter 16 and water in chapter 17. That means God says, anything you need, I can provide. And he did provide for them. And then finally, God prepared them. And that's in 19 and 20. And, uh, and actually, it goes on uh, through 24. And basically, what happens there is that God shows them how to come before him. In 19, he warns them to come to the mountain. He says, don't touch it. And if even an animal touches it, the animal will be killed, etc., etc. And then they come to the mountain, and all of a sudden it was quaking. It looked like an earthquake. It looked like a volcano. It was surrounded by a cloud. There were lightnings and like that. And Moses goes up there. And they all thought he was going to be incinerated. And you remember when he comes down, his face is glowing? He had to, they were so afraid of him, he had to put a little covering on his face because his face was glowing. Well, 
That's the way out of ignorance and into God's law and his program, and it shows that God is holy. That's the second division of the book. The third division of the book, God shows them the way out of the world. That's chapters 25 to 40. What I'm talking about there is how to get into God's presence, how to get into his presence and stay in his presence. Fascinating. It's really a blessing. It shows that God's friendly. I mean, he, God is the one that sought out Adam and Eve, we saw in Genesis. God is the one that's always been chasing us, and he is friendly. If you want, I don't know if that's one of the attributes of God, but it's wonderful that he wants to reveal himself. Okay, let's uh, look at the tabernacle. The tabernacle points to God. The brazen altar, and if you want to jot this down, speaks of the total devotion of Christ. The brazen altar had the offerings that were totally burnt. It was a total burnt offering. When they burned it, you couldn't keep any of it. A lot of the offerings they didn't destroy, or they didn't offer completely to God. A lot of them, you just threw it in a pot, boiled it, and pulled out some of it. And, and the priest got to eat it. But the burnt offering was there, and it speaks of Christ's total devotion, how he was totally consumed by our sins and are in the sacrifice for our sins. Secondly, the labor. The labor speaks of Christ, the eternal cleanser. Now, we're, we just moved in. And by the way, I'll say it for the last time. We started moving last night at 10 o'clock. I moved till 3 o'clock this morning, had a brief coffee break, and we started moving in at 6.30 and got done at 6 o'clock tonight. It was a very exciting day. But on the way out, Bonnie said, have you seen the cleanser? And I thought about this point right here. You know, you can never find your comet or your liquid, whatever you're looking for, to your Clorox. Did you know that Jesus is the eternal cleanser? There is no sin that we can commit that he cannot cleanse us of. The, now you say, wait a minute, what about the unpardonable sin? The unpardonable sin, biblically speaking, was only possible to commit if you were alive in Christ's time in his earthly ministry and you said what he was doing was done by the power of Satan. That's the only time unpardonable sin. There is a sin unto death, 1 John 5. A sin unto death is when you persist in a sin and won't repent of it and God kills you. But that is forgivable. There are really only two unforgivable sins. One is blaspheming the Holy Spirit and saying that Jesus did his miracles by the power of Satan. The second one is denying and not accepting and not believing in Christ. Those are the only two unforgivable sins. There's only two sins people will go to hell forever for. Unbelief in Christ and the total rejection and, and blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus is the eternal cleanser. Thirdly, the, the third article that's in there is the lampstand. And the lampstand speaks of Christ as the light of the world. And if you think about this, and, and I don't want to go into the tabernacle too deeply, but you ought to spend some time studying it. The tabernacle was really ugly on the outside. It was just old black animal skins. On the inside, it was beautiful, crafted gold and silver and the most exquisite woods. Did you know that's kind of the way God likes it? You know what it says in First Peter? It says, Likewise, ye women, let not your adorning be merely the outward putting on of raiment and putting, back then they used to split their hair around and put pearls in them and gold and, and women wouldn't wash their hair for three months because it cost so much and it took so long to get their head looked like the Tower of Babel and they'd go around and there'd be all these precious stones in it, you know, and they'd go around. And Caesar's wife had, back then, 50,000 uh, uh, months of wages in just her, her head, you know, and she'd go around with this big thing. Okay, God says, don't, don't worry about the external as much as you worry about the internal. And that's why that lampstand was in there, because that lampstand was inside that ugly black tent, and the inside was lit by this pure gold lampstand exquisitely made. You know, you could have just gotten a, one from Walmart, right? But God says, no, no, I want a hand-carved one that, that is made specifically this way. The lampstand shows that Christ is the light of the world. The showbread, that was a table of showbread. It was across the uh, side of the tent. The showbread speaks of Christ as the bread of life, and it's, it was a constant thanks offering. It was a constant... The priest would bake this stuff, 12 little loaves, and by the way, what's neat about it is that you can thank God and you can fellowship with God, doesn't matter how big or little you are uh, in man's eyes, because even the smallest tribe had the same size loaf that got placed before God. And the showbread is much like this table. In fact, this is a kind of a Christianization of the showbread table, because when the priest came and put the bread on that little table called the table of the showbread, actually showbread is literally the table of the face or the bread of the face. What it was is, on this side was God, and they'd come and they'd bring their little loaf like this, and they'd set it in front of God, and when they stood there, they were kind of having a meal with God. What's the Lord's table? God invites us to commune with him at a supper. Isn't that neat? You see how a lot of the Old Testament things have been 
fulfilled in Christ. Uh, but the showbread speaks of Christ as the bread of life. It's the bread that, that gives us sustenance. It's the bread that, of fellowship. It's the bread of thanks. The next item, the fifth one, is the altar of incense. And the altar of incense, interestingly enough, there was a lampstand over here as you came in, and over here was the showbread, and right in front of you was this altar of incense. And it was right backed up to the curtain. On the other side, you're in the holy place. And by the way, if you walked in the front gate, the first thing you see is a brazen altar. Next thing you see is a laver. Then when you get through that, there is a tent inside the tent, and there's a little curtain. You'd go through that curtain, and as soon as you walked in, you would see this altar of incense, this lampstand, and the showbread, just kind of like that. The altar of incense speaks of the fact that Christ is the constant intercessor and priest for us. It's the idea of a constant smoke ascending upward. And that incense was like the intercessory prayers going up to God before you could go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And so Christ is the ultimate intercessor. It says in the book of Hebrews, he ever liveth, Hebrews 7.25, to make intercession for us. And so he is like our altar of incense. And that's why we don't need priests because we become priests to offer sacrifices to God. The next uh, item is the Holy of Holies. And that speaks of the fact that Jesus Christ is the very holy of holies. And when we have him living inside of us and the Holy Spirit indwelling us, that we become the holy place of God. It's very interesting that um, in the scriptures it says in 1 Corinthians 6, it says, What? Know you not that your body is the naos, the temple of God? Did you know there's two words for temple, hitaron and naos? You know what hitaron means? Just the building. Naos means the inside Holy of Holies. Just to show you what Judas was like. Remember Judas that betrayed Christ for how much? 30 pieces of silver. How much could you buy a slave for in Christ's day? 30 pieces of silver. I mean a normal slave. I don't mean a great slave. I don't mean a beautiful slave. I don't mean a you know Arnold Schwarzenegger slave. I mean a normal slave. How much? So how much did Judas think Christ was worth? It wasn't anything great. He's just kind of like the, the least you can get. Remember his heart, he kind of had second thoughts about it, felt bad about it, and went back to the priest and said, I want to give you your money back? And they said, uh uh-uh. No, you, you know, it's a deal. And it's you are the one that betrayed him. And so do you remember what it says? It says he threw the money down in the temple. It doesn't say hit Iran. It says naos. That means he went into the temple to talk to those guys. And when they wouldn't do it, he took his silver and he threw it up over the curtain into the holy place. Isn't it interesting how blasphemous he was? He took the blood money that he betrayed Christ and threw it into the place where Christ was portrayed. Very interesting. There's a lot of interesting insight there. Also, the second area I'd like to talk to you about, not only does a tabernacle point to God, but secondly, the colors speak of Christ. There are four colors. If you were going into the tabernacle in the, in the uh, Old Testament time, there was white, blue, scarlet, and purple. And white was the color of perfection, you know, it's pure white. It was parallel to the Gospel of Luke, which shows Christ as the perfect man. So when you think of the white in the tabernacle, you think of perfection. And what does Luke spend 24 chapters proving? Luke talks totally about Christ, and it talks about the fact that Jesus, in his demeanor, Jesus, in his ability to walk the roads of Galilee, Jesus, in the way he spoke to children, the way he talked to old people and sick people and dying people and demon-possessed people, was perfect in everything. And everybody was just thronging him. And Luke says Jesus was the perfect man. And that's parallel with the fact that the temple, or the tabernacle, was white. Secondly, the, the tabernacle was blue. There were blue tapestries hanging. And blue is always the color of heaven. And what's interesting is that John's gospel shows Christ as the divine one. The whole purpose of the gospel of John is to show that Jesus was God. In fact, I told you last week, what are the three books that are actually four that are always attacked? Genesis, because it talks about the origins. Daniel, because it's so prophetic. John, because it presents Christ as God, divine. And who wants that? And who wants someone to ruin your party that's going to judge you? Um, And how fitting that the blue there speaks of heaven and it speaks of the fact that Christ is divine. The third color in the tabernacle was scarlet. And scarlet, of course, is the color of what? Blood. Yeah, red, blood. And what does blood have to do with? Sacrifices. And Christ was the perfect servant in the Gospel of Mark who willingly came to sacrifice himself. 
In fact, the whole Gospel of Mark, I don't know if you ever thought about this, and we're going to go through these soon, but each of the Gospels was written to a different target audience. It's kind of like, I don't know if you've been noticing, but advertising, the, the ads are targeting people nowadays. Uh, they're, they're very careful in what ads they run at what time of the day because they know the demographics and the socioeconomic figures of what people like. And so Matthew wrote his gospel to the Jews, and he showed Jesus Christ as the perfect king. Mark wrote his gospel to the Roman world, and he showed Jesus as a perfect servant because most of the Roman world was what? Conquered peoples, which they became slaves. Did you know that there were more slaves in Rome than there were free people? There were 100 million people, and about 60 or 70 million of them were slaves. That means almost everybody just kind of sat around and ate grapes all day, except for the people that were working. You know what I mean? And that's what the world was like. You say, how do you know Mark was written to slaves and to the Roman Empire? Because every time something from the Old Testament is mentioned, Mark explains it. He never, he never just says, you know, go to the temple. He says, go to the temple where the big pots are, where they throw the money in, or go to where the water is poured out, or go to uh, the Sabbath day's journey, which is this far. He always explains all the Jewish stuff because he wasn't writing the Jews, and they didn't know about it. And so he explains it. And John was written to the whole world and shows Christ as divine. But scarlet speaks of Christ as a perfect sacrifice. And finally, purple is a color of royalty, not to us, but in the ancient world, the... The little shellfish that produced the dye that made things deep purple were very... Remember Dorcas, seller of purple, right? It was very rare. The murex, little, I mean, these are little tiny, tiny shellfish. And you, you get and extract this purple color from them. And so if you wore purple clothes, it's kind of like those gold and platinum hubcaps that people are killing for nowadays. You know, it was a status symbol to have purple Purple is the color of royalty. Only wealthy and, and uh, either wealthy or royal people could wear it, those that were um, big in the world. That parallels Matthew's gospel, which speaks of Christ as the perfect king. Well, the priesthood and all the regulations about that leads us to God, and the priesthood was, was in the Old Testament to lead the people to God. And now, as I said, it says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6, that there is only one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a sacrifice to all. And we don't need, or for all, and we don't need a priesthood. We are a priesthood now. And then the regulations, letter C, reflect God. Now, someone just asked me, and I just got about a five-page letter on my desk, and they said, please explain whether or not we're under the law anymore. And I, you know, it's kind of hard to say yes or no. Why? Because there was ceremonial law, there was social law, there was civil law, and there was moral law. Does God's character ever change? No. So do you think his moral law ever changes? Mm -mm. Now, the, the way you punish it changes. That's the civil law. Do you remember what they did to a, a witch in the Old Testament? They'd burn them. Are we supposed to burn witches nowadays? No. God will do that in his time. We don't. So see, we're not in the civil law, but has God's character changed at all? Is murder still wrong? Yes. Should we not take the name of the Lord our God in vain? No, we shouldn't take it in vain. You see what I mean? The, the ceremonial law is passed. We can eat lobster. Now, it might not be good for your health. You know, it might be expensive, but we can eat it. We don't have to stop all ex cessation of activity on Saturday. We don't have to follow the Jewish ceremonial law. Okay, now let's zero in. That's the whole book. The whole book of, of Exodus. If anybody asks you what Exodus is about, it's the way out. Exodus means the way out. And it's, first of all, the way out of bondage, secondly, out of ignorance, and thirdly, out of the world. But now, I want, and you can take your Bibles and, and turn with me to chapter 7 of um, the book of Exodus, okay? I want to show you Moses and the finger of God. And we're going to learn some lessons from false gods. And I want to show you why the Bible is so significant, because everything the Bible says has been put there for a purpose. Everything. I remember the first time I read through the Bible. My parents made me read through the Bible, and I had to read through the Bible, you know, and just, oh, brother. And I thought, well, you know, I could have finished this days ago if they didn't have all this needless detail. You ever think about that? All those kings and, and you know, put the, the little bells on the bottom of their robes and, you know, put um, these little herbs or, or these little fruits, pomegranates, around the robe of the priest, and then, you know, all this stuff. And you think, what is that for? But you know, the more you read it, the more you ask the Lord to open your heart, the more you see that every bit of it's there for a purpose. And let me show you lessons from false gods. Now listen before you start taking notes, okay? Ancient Egypt, at its zenith, 
15 centuries before Christ, that's when Moses was there, was awesome. The pyramids, when Moses was there, were over a thousand years old and they glistened in the sun. They were the wonders of the ancient world, hands down, the greatest wonder of the ancient world, those pyramids. They still are very... The pyramids you see today, and if you ever clamber down them, they're really kind of not very impressive until you get up close and see the size of those rocks. And now, in fact, last time I was there, they wouldn't even let us climb up it anymore because too many people climbing up it is ruining it, you know, getting their little dirty hands on it. But I mean, when you finally get there and you stand there and you go, the only thing close to it uh, are some of the temples now they're excavating in the, in the tropics. But it was, it was amazing to see those thousand-year-old pyramids that, that were alabaster covered. They had the sheathing on them that made them just glisten in the radiance of the desert sun as they towered ominously over this proud and powerful people. They were led by god kings, or pharaohs as we call them. They were sons of the god Kum. You say they were? Well, they claimed to be. And they were descendants of the sun god, Ra. That was the greatest of all the gods of Egypt, the sun that went overhead. They said that that sun was a god and that they were descendants of the sun. They were bearers of divinity to the masses. The pharaohs were kind of like they would bring God down to the common people so they could kind of have his blessing. And so that's why they were so important. And Egypt had known along the mighty river Nile prosperity, total agricultural fertility, and productive lives and absolute peace. That's what they were living in for centuries. That's why they built all those temples. They weren't fighting anybody. But a nation had been growing up in their midst for over 400 years. It had started with just one old man and 12 boys. Jacob and his 12 sons and his daughters and their families had flourished, and in Goshen they now numbered nearly 3 million people. Now, do you see what we're building to here? Here's this proud nation that hasn't had a problem for centuries. They've got their big temples and their pyramids. They've got their god kings walking around doing their thing. And here is this kind of... This, this fast-growing weed that's off in Goshen, kind of where no Egyptian went because Egyptians despised cows and sheep. They worshipped them, but they didn't like being around them. They didn't like the smell. And so off in Goshen, where it smelled, they had these people, and they were flourishing. And God had promised to the grandfather of Jacob, Abraham, that his descendants would be as numberless as the sands of the sea, and for one man to become three million is a vast multiplication. That's what happened in 400 years. Now, here's what's happening. The greatest ancient empire, and did you know, even today, the most popular empire in the ancient world is guess what? What gets more attention than the other empire? Guess. Egypt, not even Rome. Egypt does it. I mean, there are more people that, when you have a King Tut thing, they'll line up. I mean, you bring, you bring a Caesar exhibit and see whether people will line up for it. They don't. Why is it? Because they love the, the splendors of ancient Egypt. Because no one even knows how they made the pyramids. Nobody knows where all the treasures are. They just found the hundred sons of Ramses II. They found his tomb. And it was underneath the bathhouse. I remember when I went to uh, the Valley of the Kings the last time and went to the bathhouse, I noticed that their bathhouse there, you're in this bathhouse and there's a pipe going out the back and everything's just spreading out behind it. In other words, it was just an open cesspool just out there. Guess where they found the tombs of the hundred sons of Ramses II under the bathhouse? You know what? The roof caved in because of all those years of all that stuff. But it didn't destroy it. And right now, they're excavating, and some of those tombs are still sealed. They've never been touched, and they can't wait to see what's in there. But what we're seeing here tonight is the greatest ancient empire, Egypt, versus the enslaved people of God, Israel. And you see, God let this happen. He let one nation build itself up religiously. In fact, even to this day, if you're in the occult, and I hope none of you are, but if you're in the occult, one of the greatest sources, or the, the most horrible sources, of occultic incantations to make people sick and stuff like that is a book called The Sixth Book of Moses. If you know anything about the occult, it's called The Sixth Book of Moses. Why? Because the, the center for occultic worship in fact, the only two warlocks we know from 4,000 years ago, names are in the Bible, and their names are Jannies and Jambres. They were magicians that could throw down a rod and make a snake out of it. They were magicians that could do every kind of magical incantational art. And so here comes this collision. But more than being Egypt against Israel, it was also, and look at this, it was God's people versus Satan's people. 
That's what Exodus is all about. It's God's promise that I'm going to make the seed of Israel become the Messiah. Remember, that's what God said to, God promised to Eve that someday her seed would crush Satan. That's all of redemption. That's the whole story of redemption. And Satan knew that, and he looked, and there goes Abraham, and he watched, and there's Isaac, and now Jacob, now he's got 12 sons. Ah, we'll get him down here in Egypt, and we'll kill all the firstborn sons. When you kill all the firstborn sons, what do you lose? You don't have Jews anymore. You've got half Jews and the other half Egyptians, right? You get the idea? He was going to destroy the Israelite nation. And so just as that pharaoh, the pharaoh of the oppression, whose name was Thutmose III, and if you go over there, you can go through his temple or through his tomb, um, that pharaoh says, kill all the firstborn sons. And just when that happened, God raised up Moses, protected him. Remember the little ark and the bulrushes and the whole thing? And his daughter's name was Hatshepsut, and she was a very powerful woman, and she took him out of the water Says, I want one of these Hebrew boys. I'm going to raise him for my own. And God used Satan's people to do God's work. She didn't know that she was raising the one who was going to deliver the children of Israel. Thirdly, we have God's power versus the kingdom of darkness. We have one 80-year-old man and his brother against all the magicians, all the necromancers, that's people who communicate with the dead, all of the people that are involved in the witchcraft of Egypt. We've got an army, actually legions of priests. Remember I told you that the temple of Amun-Re, just the wall around it was 40 miles long? Do you know how many priests that were? One of the largest bodies of water in Egypt is the cleansing pond. When you're on a tour, it takes you about an hour to walk around the thing. It was the largest pool I've ever seen. And that's where they would go down and wash themselves, these thousands of priests. But it was God's power against the kingdom of darkness arrayed. It was two 80-year-old men against Pharaoh, his armies, and the entire religion of Egypt. It was shy Moses. Remember, Moses says, I can't talk. God says, send Aaron. Remember uh, when God called to Moses from the burning bush? Moses said, here am I, Lord, send Aaron. You know, he was really a willing missionary. Proud Pharaoh against shy Moses. The whole plan of redemption against the whole plan of the rebellion. That's what's shaping up. You see why Exodus is so exciting? I mean, you don't get it any clearer than in the book of Exodus. You have God who looks pitifully small and two 80-year-old men. You've got Satan with all of his armies and his priests and his magicians. And they've got their swords and they've got all their temples and their pyramids. And it looks like they're going to just mow down Moses. But they don't. Let's examine the plagues in the light of the worship of all the Egyptian gods. The captors of the captive Jews were proud of their false worship, and God is about to humble them. This God was the prime God, and the reason God made it dark in the ninth plague was he wanted to tell them that God, who is light, struck the heart of all Egyptian religion, and their worship of the sun god was false, and their sun god was powerless, and his legions of priests that overflowed the largest of all the temples of the temple of Amun-Re were powerless. And Ra's wife, Mut, and his son, Cones, and Hathor, the goddess who controlled the sky, and Horus, who was the son of Ra. No one could undo what God had done. And Isis and Osiris, who watched over the afterlife, were watching over it in darkness, because God alone gives the true light to guide people to his truth. Well, by this time, the people of Egypt were saying, "Uh, Pharaoh, could you get rid of these people? I mean, we can't take this anymore. And so Moses just came before Pharaoh, and he says, you're never going to see me again. He said, you're never going to see my face again. But he announced. He said, God is going to kill the firstborn of every animal, every cattle of the field, and of every human being. Now, do you ever think about this? Have you ever gone by a stockyard and looked at all those cows out there? Have you ever wondered how to pick out which one was the firstborn in each family? I mean, you couldn't even tell who was the father and who was the mother, right? You know, God said the firstborn of every field animal and the firstborn of every male of all of the children I'm going to kill tonight. But if you will take a little bowl of blood taken by cutting the throat of a little lamb, hold the bowl under there, let the lifeblood of that lamb gush out and it give its life for you to get that blood. And if you'll take that and go out and get some, some hyssop sticks, bundle them together and take those hyssop sticks and put it in your bowl and paint kind of like graffiti around your door. Put blood on both sides of your door and over the top. God says, if you'll do that, I won't kill your firstborn cow and I won't kill your firstborn son. You know what people said? I'm not going to ruin my brand new... I just had my house painted. 
You think I would put blood on my house? Blood? What a gory thing. I'm not going to kill a lamb. That night, nothing we can imagine could come close to what happened on Passover night. Life was going on in Egypt kind of like normal. That past Moses had caused some problems, but nothing we couldn't forget. But from cradle to stall, all the firstborn known only to God were struck. And that night, the wail and moans must have been indescribably chilling. Can you imagine all the people hearing a sound, the sound of the death angel? Maybe a whirring sound, maybe a sound of a sword. They heard something and they kind of wonder if that old Moses, you know, has been right so far, but not this. I'm sure that they bolted their doors. I'm sure they closed their windows. I'm sure that they put the baby between them if they had a firstborn son. But that night, the death angel crossed Egypt and there was not a home that didn't face his destructive power except those that had blood over the door. Why did God do this? Number one, to say that only blood, the blood of God's sacrifice. And by the way, there are a couple things you can fill in. We'll go to tell them that only blood could keep his wrath at bay. Egypt was powerful and pampered, but on that night, the death angel would make an unforgettable visit. There's some powerful lessons built into Passover. Let's talk about them. Number one, it was un unspeakable. You don't have to write anything down, but let me read this to you. To even imagine a supernatural messenger of doom was to hunt and kill your firstborn was beyond words. But that anyone could pick out the firstborn of men and livestock in the unlit blackness of an Egyptian night was imperceivable. And to know it was tonight was beyond words. Can you imagine the fear of those people as they went to bed that night? I can imagine all the Jewish boys saying, uh, Dad, did, uh, did you? Could, let's go out and check the door. <laughs> did you do it? Oh, okay, yeah, there's blood. Okay, Dad. <laughs> I'm firstborn. I, I want to make it through. Can you imagine how much more the kids believed in God? They participated. I mean, they were... They were afraid. Secondly, it was unavoidable. There was no place to hide. There was no family he didn't visit. Every family would be noticed and examined from the poorest to the richest, from those living in huts, of the farming peasants, to those in the ivory halls of the palaces, and all would see the dark shadow of the death angel come over their house. It was unavoidable. Thirdly, it was unstoppable. There was no power on earth. There was nothing then or now that could have stopped that stalking death. There was nothing that would deflect his sword except blood. And it was unexpected. Life was moving along as expected. Business was as usual. That old fanatic was still crying judgment. But we live in a real world, not some world of a God who can't see and he can't judge us. Remember, the gods of Egypt were put to bed every night in their temples and awakened each day and fed and clothed and put on display. Doesn't that sound just like what people say about preaching about hell? You ever think about that? Those old fuddy-duddies still trying to bother me at work. You know, those old preachers still talking about their hell. It's impossible. People are going to be just as shocked as the children who are the parents of the children who died in the Passover plague. Well, here you can fill in. There was a full salvation. God's offer was number one, salvation. You can write that on that line. God offered a way out, salvation. Secondly, God's plan was substitution. And you know, I want you to understand, if you want to know what the gospel is all about, the center of the gospel, if you want to make sure, you know, a lot of people come to me. In fact, one of the main reasons people come to me, they want to make sure they're saved. I just talked to a, a lovely gentleman. His name is, um, what is his name? I just, he had, Boston was his name. His first name was Boston. He was just an interesting fellow. Lives up in North Tulsa, and he wasn't sure he was saved. He wanted to talk about that. And I said, you want to, if you want to make sure that you're truly a born-again person, you've got to understand the concept of substitution. You know what that is? He gave himself for me. It's not as much as I can do good plus God. It's not whether I've done enough or if I've been religious or prayed the right words or... Mm, none of that matters. You can pray the wrong words and get saved. If you realize that Jesus gave himself for me. Because God's plan is substitution. Thirdly, God's method was a sprinkling of blood. And the one that gave himself for us was Jesus Christ. In, in Exodus, it was the blood splattered from an innocent lamb over the doorpost. For us, it was the innocent, spotless lamb of God whose blood was splattered and sprinkled out for us. And finally, God's promise was sufficient. God included in his promise not only deliverance from death, you didn't get killed by the death angel, but provisions of all needs for life, and you could go to the promised land. Now, isn't that neat? So what does the Lord want us to remember? The Passover. 
What should you remember out of the whole book of Exodus? The Passover. And what about it? That it was all about God's offer of salvation, his plan of substitution, his method was the sprinkling of blood, and his promise is sufficient. I hope that you'll always remember how wonderful the book of Exodus is. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Thank you, dear Lord, for this precious group of saints who come. But Father, I believe that in a group this size, there could be some that are trusting in something other than simply Jesus who gave himself for them. And I pray that you would knock at their heart's door. And Father, would you please convict and tug at their heart. And wouldn't it be wonderful if it was a time when they came to hide beneath the blood of Jesus Christ to escape the wrath of God forever. Help us to drink deeply of your word in the days ahead. We'll thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen.